And so, Jake, that, I did a quick check that does put us a quorum. Awesome. Thank you, Jonathan. Awesome. With quorum, uh, I'd like to open it up for a vote on our July meeting minutes. Do I have a second? Seconded. Awesome. Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Any nays? I'll okay. abstain since I wasn't there. Okay, great. Um, or not great, but we missed you. Um, but with that, we have our meeting minutes approved. Um, and we'll shift it over to public comment. Okay, let me... We had one person sign up for public comment, and she is not in on the meeting yet. So um, since we only had one sign up, I was wondering if anybody that is over Mark O'Brien, we're going to just gonna open it. Since we have a little bit of time, I'm going to open it up and see if anyone would like to speak. Mark O'Brien raised his hand. Um, I'm going to move you over, Mark, and you have um, three minutes. Let me know when you're when you're over. Mark, I, Mark, you have to um, accept. There you go. I think you're with us, Mark. I see you. Okay, am I with you? You are. Welcome. Okay. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity and thanks for your work. And uh, I work in the community, a community advocate and outreach worker, and uh, just want to learn about, observe, listen, first time in one of your meetings. So um, kind of the area I'm looking at right now is uh, fencing that's put up for large encampment, uh, large encampment encumbrance cleanups. Um, just making sure that uh, they have a traffic management plan, that they are uh, taking down the fencing after the uh, camping abatement and that they're not blocking sidewalks and streets for uh, everybody, including uh, people with disabilities, non-sighted people, um, ADA type stuff. Um, uh, I've been kind of tuning in some of that. Also on the uh, fencing, of uh, public right-of-way easements, um, noticing a lot of uh, areas where there's real safety issues. Um, I've had cyclists and pedestrians say that it's very concerning for them. Uh, bent T posts, uh, mesh fencing on the ground, uh, people getting out of their cars, getting caught in the fencing, um, no room between the curb and the street and their car door and the rocks. Um, tunnel where it's very dangerous because razor scooters and bikes are coming down the sidewalk and uh, elderly people, frail people said they've almost been run over and there's no way to step off, you know, onto the easement because it's fenced. So um, want to just connect, learn, understand kind of where you guys are, are, are at, but those are the things I wanted to, to touch on that I look forward to talking with you about going forward. Thanks, Mark. Thank you. I have another hand up um, in the attorney side. Chris Nicholson, I'm going to um, promote you to panelist. You have to accept and let us know when you're, you've joined us. Hi there. Um, can you guys all hear me OK? Yes, welcome. How oh, fantastic. Um, so I'm jumping on, I've been uh, told uh, by uh, some friends on council about the wonderful work that you do, and I'd been meaning to attend before. Um, I've uh, been living downtown for about four years now in District 9, and um, in the last 18 months, two years or so, uh, the uh, micro-mobility devices, the scooters, the rental scooters in particular, have gone from... Uh, something that I championed and something that was a wonderful way to get around downtown um, into a menace, honestly. Um, the number of times that I've seen people crash into scooters, scooters crash into each other, people fall onto the pavement after crashing into light posts, um, people 
zipping by at 15 miles an hour, uh, my front door on 17th street, um, our downtown was not built to handle scooters. And so far, uh, the attempts by DOTI uh, to put in place regulations that safely handle them um, have not worked. Um, it is not safe downtown right now on our streets, excuse me, on our sidewalks, uh, because we refuse to do something about the way that people are riding scooters down here. Um, I'm sure you've heard this before a million times. Um, I'm on here because I know there's been some discussion about it recently in the Denver Post. Uh, DOTI has come to some community meetings. And um, my hope is that um, your group will take uh, similar action in not getting rid of the scooters. I think there are plenty of bike lanes where they can be riding safely. Um, but not putting pedestrians, residents at risk uh, who just want to have a safe, you know, walk downtown and not have to jump out of the way when someone comes barreling at them at 15 miles an hour or two people who are drunk because they were downtown and it looks fun. And that's what we're dealing with. These things aren't being used to get around. They're being used for joyriding most of the time. And that's just not a, a good trade off to make in downtown Denver. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Chris. Let me see if anyone else, we have just a little bit, if anyone else in the attendees, if you would like to say, um, have public comment, um, please raise your hand. Okay, Jake, I don't see anything and I don't see um, Peggy Matthews Forney. She originally had signed up for speaker. We'll, we'll um, maybe tag back with her and see if she can make the next meeting. So I'll turn it back to you, Jake. Awesome. Thank you, Michelle. Jamie, did you have a comment for us? Yeah, just for clarification, uh, Mark, when we talk about those issues that you brought up, uh, we refer to that as right away. And Chris, we will be talking about uh, some suggestions today from the policy committee uh, concerning scooters and bikes. So I hope you hang on and listen for that. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, with public comment concluded, uh, we'll turn it over to the report from Dottie leadership. Um, I do believe I saw Director Phipps on. I don't know. If I think Earl, right. I think Earl Jackson, the CFO, Earl, is going to speak, and then um, perhaps um, Adam might speak afterwards. So I'll turn it over to Earl, please. Artificial pressure for Director Phipps on my part. <laughs> oh no, this. All is fine. Um, I'm actually going to go ahead and turn it over to Adam. I didn't have very many comments for today, other than that Nick is out on vacation this week. So uh, not a lot of remarks, but I know that Adam had uh, quite a few uh, to talk to today. So I'll give it to Adam. Yeah, uh, thank you, Earl, and uh, thank you, committee. Um, I do have to jump over to city council here in a little bit, but just wanted to touch on uh, a little bit of what happened uh, yesterday. So um, for, as all of you are aware, uh, we got quite the storm that came through Denver. Um, in fact, um, the city park area really got hit the hardest. This is a very, very localized storm, which we tend to see um, in the summer months over the spring months where a portion of town may be completely um, zero rain whatsoever and another of uh, a significant amount of volume. So we had in a 10 minute period, um, or excuse me, 13 minutes rather, between 7.10 and 7.23 p.m. yesterday, 1.73 inches. Um, of rain hit uh, the Denver Zoo, uh, our weather station right there at the Denver Zoo. That is a tremendous amount of water. Um, you know, I'm happy to say that from an infrastructure standpoint within the city and county of Denver, um, our storm system did an incredible job, uh, specifically um, what you saw from the completed uh, Platte to Park Hill project in 2018. Uh, for anybody that's had the opportunity to, to kind of get out and about today, you can see a pretty significant amount of disruption, um, specifically in the uh, North Park Hill, South Park Hill, Northeast Park Hill area. Um, a lot of where those mature trees are, you see a lot of debris in the roadway, but uh, largely our infrastructure system did an incredible job handling that volume. Now that's not to say there wasn't uh, some localized flooding. Um, we really have the trunk of our system in place now. We're going to continue to look at upgrading uh, within individual neighborhoods to make sure that we uh, bring our entire infrastructure system up to a uh, uh, 21st century uh, type of performance level, but really uh, avoided what would have likely been significant um, displacement from a residential standpoint. 
uh, if we hadn't had those types of improvements in place. Um, the back nine um, at City Park, um, at least in the middle of the night last night and kind of mid morning this morning, both the times I put my eyes on it, um, had about 12 feet of water in it, which is exactly what the system is designed to do, to temporarily retain water uh, to prevent that water from entering homes. Um, you know, we also have uh, been able to prioritize uh, system upkeep over the last couple of years. And um, as of right now, we haven't had a single report of a blocked um, manhole or, uh, or uh, conveyance uh, um, inlet cover uh, that resulted in localized flooding. So um, overall, from a system standpoint, uh, really achieved what we wanted to. Um, again, there are certainly folks within our community right now that have had uh, vehicle damage from vehicles parked on the street, uh, maybe some, some very localized flooding of the garage and so forth. And so uh, certainly uh, some folks that are, that are dealing with that today and, and will be for a couple more days. But, by and large, we saw a systemic shift in how our system operates specifically for uh, some of our more, more vulnerable neighborhoods. So happy to report out on that. Um, the, the downside is uh, the uh, CDOT and the C70 team uh, weren't quite so lucky. Um, it does look as though there was a, an issue with uh, one of the pumping stations on the westbound lanes um, and a significant amount of flooding uh, with, a, with a number of water rescues that had to be performed by uh, Denver Fire Department. And so we, of course, um, are working with them closely to help them understand where and how that failure occurred to make sure that it doesn't happen in the future. Um, the, the portion of uh, C70 that flooded, of course, is uh, the area underneath the cover. Um, that system does not connect into Denver's wastewater system. It pumps directly into the uh, South Platte River. And so um, this is uh, an issue that we're going to try to do um, everything we can to help our partners at CDOT address to ensure this doesn't happen in the future. Uh, but are, are thankful that uh, it wasn't worse because that amount of rain, 1.73 inches uh, in 13 minutes, is, is, is pretty unprecedented. Um, in, in the city and county. So um, let me just pause there. I figured that might be on the top of everybody's uh, mind and uh, happy to take any questions uh, as it relates to that. I have a question. Yeah. My, my hand is up if no one's gonna call on me. Um, my name's Lucia Brown and um, my understanding uh, is that the Flat, the park to river, I can't remember what it's called, but the big 39th Street Canal mm -hmm. was built and the golf course, that whole thing was to deal with the one in 100 year flood. Is that right? Correct. So it was designed for a 100 year flood. That is correct. Right. So last night's was like a one in five year flood and um, uh, it overflowed. Oh, I got video of it overflowing near Franklin and 39th, overflowing its banks and flooding the streets. And you can see evidence of it if you drive by it, which I did earlier today. So, I mean, if even if it's a one in 10 year flood, it certainly was not a one in a hundred year flood. And if it's overflowing at that level, to me, uh, it doesn't seem, we've spent hundreds of millions of dollars and it's not getting the job done for, for what it's, for what it's actually designed for. It may have helped for last night's, but last night's was not that significant compared to a one in 100 year flood. Let, 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 me, um, let me share some, uh, some facts that I think might help uh, understand the way that the flood design works. So when you look at, when you look at flood design, um, we say we, we design for the 100 year event. That assumes a certain amount of rainfall over a one hour time period. It's rain intensity uh, that, really drives the amount of flow that you see in a system. If you look at that 13 minutes, at that rainfall of 1.73 inches, we're at a greater than 90 year storm. And so when you look at the performance of the system, although we didn't have sustained rain over the entire 60 minutes, we certainly saw something that was very close to what the ultimate design guide and standards are for a 100 year system. And so I know I've seen some uh, info out in the news um, today and even yesterday that spoke to, is this a five years, is this a 10 years and a 25 year flood? Because this storm was so localized and because if, for, for any of you that are residents in Southeast Denver, you saw really next to no precipitation whatsoever, that, that data is difficult to interpret because it depends on where it was. And this P2P system was designed for exactly where the water came down at. Um, and it came down at that rate that half, if it was sustained for 90 minutes, um, or excuse me, 60 minutes rather, would have gotten us very close to that 100 year flood standard. All right, Jamie? Yeah, I was curious, Adam, do you guys have any plans for tree removal, um, helping the residents out with that? 
We, we do. So not only do we have crews out um, all day today um, working on you know, any debris removal um, from um, the right away from within parks, within medians, anywhere, um, we're also going to open up a uh, recycling center as well uh, for any of that tree debris. So uh, we'll get a press release out. In fact, I'm hoping we get that out uh, the run on the evening news cycle that uh, inform where and when you can take those tree branches in and get them recycled. Do we have other questions from the board for the director? I'm not seeing any director FIPS, which should get you back for city council in, in relatively good timing. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, certainly. And uh, as always, um, appreciate uh, all the work that everybody does, as well as our guests here that are listening in. And um, if you guys ever have any questions, comments, or concerns, you can certainly get those to Earl or Nick or uh, email myself directly. So again, thank you for your time, and I'll see you guys later. Great. Thank you, Director Phipps. All right. Um, the next item on our agenda is the Board Policy Committee uh, micro mobility recommendations. So I think for this section, I'll turn it over to you, Jamie, correct? I think you might be on mute, Jamie. There we go. Thank you. Yeah, over the last uh, few months, uh, the policy committee has been kind of vetting out uh, things we could do for the micro transit issue concerning uh, scooters and bikes and we came up with several uh, recommendations uh, this is not an exhaustive list but we were just kind of trying to pick the low-hanging fruit on things that could help improve um, uh, the operation of these devices um, i know the city is getting a lot of pressure especially from the downtown businesses to change something um, but we also know that there is a contract with the vendors, so we didn't want to, you know, get too deep into changing that or trying to alter that. Um, so we'll just, we did send out this list earlier. So um, just, just to briefly go through it, we, our recommendation on bike corrals is to change the uh, ratio from 50 to 50% 50 to 80-20. So basically, this is talking about where the corrals are located. Uh, it's either below curb or above curb. Uh, we prefer below curb. We think there's enough junk <laughs> in the sidewalks right now that uh, because the sidewalks are not exactly up to standard yet, uh, that we would prefer that the bike corrals be in the street. And we also realize that it kind of has an un. Uh, a great effect for people who are pedestrians, it kind of gives them a daylighting because if we use that first parking spot uh, near the intersection, it provides better sight for them down the street. Uh, we all thought, also saw, thought that uh, some signage, which could be in the form of stickers or using existing signs, uh, basically preferred scooter routes. We, we figured that a lot of our visitors are using the scooters don't realize that adjacent to a lot of the routes that they're, they're on, including Colfax, uh, Broadway, some of the larger streets that, uh, but usually a block or two away that there's a bike lane that they could be using. Um, anecdotally, we realize that a lot of our people are asking for more bikes. Uh, that's a, a group that may not be as vocal as the scooter users. So we, we like to recommend maybe getting more bikes. They seem to be less villainous. <laughs> Uh, training, uh, we'd like to see more training, maybe just do done monthly in a very uh, visible place like Union Station or Civic Center Station where we teach people the etiquette of using scooters. You know, one of the biggest uh, issues is people leaving the scooters in the sidewalk or not using the corrals when they're available and also how to operate it uh, correctly. Uh, we were told that uh, Denver Health re averages about two to three patients a day <clears throat> on, on injuries relating to scooter and bikes. And we also mentioned messaging. Uh, we think that the, the app uh, could be uh, used for stronger language, uh, like for example, scooters are not allowed on the sidewalks or except for unloading. So these are some of the recommendations we're making. Well, we did have one comment um, oh, from one of our members. I can't remember the name. Just jump in there if you want. Uh, they were talking about transit integration. Um, we're talking about micromobility and networking. And this uh, deals with uh, the app. 
but I think we just need to vet that one a little more uh, before we uh, actually make an official recommendation. But today what we're asking you is feedback on the ones that we provided and to uh, see if we can get this, uh, this, these uh, in an official letter to Dottie for recommendations. So we'll take any questions. Jamie, that was me who added in the bit. I'm about sorry, it. Tangier. Oh, it's all good. <laughs> it's all good. Um, I added that in there, obviously realizing like, you know, the city and county of Denver is not RTD. So whatever partnership they might have with the operators in terms of, um, anyway, for those who don't know, and there's a link in the document talking about transit integration so that it's more seamless across all modes so that somebody can, check out their scooter or their bike and use the same card or paying struck you know same structure to pay to get on the bus um would be amazing and i'm not sure i don't know like where the city of denver fits in because that's more of an rtd and and the shared market mobility operators thing but the city could encourage that kind of partnership um also it seemed like this, you know, when we when we reformed into Dotty, there's something written that allows us. I don't, I don't, I I can't remember what the the framing was, but that allows the city and county of Denver to have a little bit more control over our public transportation. Um, and so, yes, like take take her. I'm not sure if we can leave it in there if it if it actually makes sense, but. I, I like the idea, Tess. Yeah, I think I think our focus was more on safety and uh, yeah. getting some immediate things. Out. I think this cool. has merit, but I, like you said, it needs a lot more vetting, and we'll definitely right. be looking at it. But thank you for the input. No problem. Can I add something really quick? Sorry, while I have the floor. Uh, um, I I don't know. Again, right there, Lime is actually testing sidewalk detection technology in Paris and other places. I don't know how close it is to coming to the United States, but it's happening. And so, because I missed the presentation, I don't have an intimate understanding of, of the city's like entire relationship with our operators, but is it something when the contracts are renewed that they can, you know, at least just say, hey, when can we get some sidewalk detection technology on your vehicles? Um, and I can put some links in here about some of that technology. That's it. Thank you, Tangier. Yeah, I think Jake could comment on that. I think he knows a little more about it. I think we've inquired uh, the technology still uh, developing, and uh, that's where I thought it was at. Go ahead, Jake. Yeah, I think, um, Tangier, I'm, I'm very <clears throat> interested in that technology and would like to see it advance. I think I think from even someone who would love for it to be implemented today, I think it's fair to admit it's not maybe not ready for game time um, at the moment. Um, but I do think that what we'd, what we'd like to implore as a potential alternative is to meet in the middle um, and, and kind of ask the uh, micro mobility providers to be our partner in that. And, and if they are able to detect patterns that might indicate sidewalk detection, instead of uh, full stopping the vehicle when they may actually be on the road um, and potentially putting the rider in a dangerous situation. Can they, at the end of the ride, inform the rider that they were riding on the sidewalk via the detection and kind of have an idea that there could be some change in behavior and incentivization from the microbiology provider that's an alternative to just shutting the vehicle down? Um, and I think that's um, kind of what we looked into a little bit further is, is, is there more of a middle ground here because that technology really um, does seem to have created a couple of dangerous incidents in other communities where it is in effect. So um, I think, and I think my understanding is that's where the department's been a little concerned historically, but if we could say, you know, <laughs> three strikes of multiple rides riding on the sidewalk or something like that, where there mm -hmm. starts to be a policy developed directly with the micro mobility companies, maybe we can get a better solution. Definitely. I have also heard about some the the safety issues that are created because scooters just shut down and you don't even know when it's going to happen. Yeah, totally. Um, I, I can definitely attest to that from personal use that uh, in the bike lane on Bannock, I've had a scooter shut down on me, uh, which should have been a fully legal situation, but because it thought I was in Civic Center Park, 
Uh, that one wasn't dangerous, but certainly confusing. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, I believe you're up next. Uh, Earl, did you want to comment on something quickly? It looked like you put your hand up in response. Uh, yeah, I did, think. Are, did you guys just? Oh, sorry, sorry. No, you're fine. Um, I think it's uh, and specifically in relation to um, the um, integration of transit uh, payment sort of integration between scooters and bikes and transit. I think, um, like I, you know, the comment was made that uh, definitely it's not something that Dottie can sort of, you know, do itself because that'd be really between RTD and the um, and the service provider. But I think that um, sort of cultivating that conversation um, is and sort of coordinating that uh, is something that I think that we might be able to um, help out with. Um, list of items that you have that you're going to put into your recommendations. That's great extra context. Thanks, Earl. And, and that, that confirmed a bit of what I was thinking. Uh, my response there was it, it was also related to the transit integration. I did see that as Dr. Cog went through its, I think, three rounds of its first two rounds of TIP funding earlier this year, calls for TIP funding. RTD submitted a couple of line items, and one of them was called Integrated Mobility as a Service, and it was essentially asking for the funding to take all seven of their apps, along with other connections like the ones we're talking about, merge it into one app that also would enable tap-to-pay solutions, so people could just like tap um, credit cards or phones or things like that, so sort of doing this all together at once. It unfortunately didn't get funded. Um, it, didn't, it didn't win out on the scoring. Um, but to Earl's point, I think that to some extent, like Dottie staff do in early stages get involved in some of Dr. Cog's scoring, um, or at least they get to weigh in on projects that um, they'd be interested in seeing from RTD to be submitted in later rounds, things along those lines. So I definitely feel like it does belong within the realm of recommendation that we, or and, and therefore also the department, could be making to say like, this is something we'd like RTD to explore and it's something that we would support them doing to some extent, even if not directly building it themselves at all. Right, and so yeah, there's, um, to that point, there across the country have been uh, a various, um, um, particularly amongst, um, and I can definitely say smaller agencies, but you've definitely seen it a lot in the larger and or the mid-sized and larger transit agencies moving over to open fare payment systems, which would allow for um, not only um, traditional transit cards to be used, but also, uh, you know, Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, you know, touching your watch, your, your uh, phone, or any other sort of uh, web-enabled mobile device on a turnstile uh, and being allowed and allowing that to be integrated into um, into potentially an Uber or a Lyft or a Lime type uh, micro mobility option for uh, interoperability across different modes. And so um, I think that there are options out there across the country that have, um, that have done that and that have either rolled that out or in the process of rolling that out. And so I think that there's a place for uh, RTD definitely to have a baseline to explore what's out there and what's being done and then to determine the best way for doing that and likely at a lower cost because some companies like you know uh, cubic systems which is the largest in the country that does that um, they'd be willing to uh, probably help facilitate some of that and see uh, and help RTD out on that front at little to no cost at least in the on the earlier front end but some larger integration would obviously uh, require a bit of funding Jake, before we go on, can we? I just want to, to focus on the on the recommendations that the policy committee made. If 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 we can focus on that before we go on to any other questions that are outside of of the list, so we don't exhaust our time here. I'd just like to get some more um, input feedback from our recommendations. Hi, this is Aileen on phone, um, on my phone. Can I make a comment? Sorry, I can't see your, your hand raised. I don't know if I'm, there's other people waiting. Um, yeah, we have we have Brian Carroll up next, Aileen, and then I'll and then you can go right after that if that works. Awesome, thanks. Great, Brian. Hey, uh, Jamie. Yeah, thanks uh, for putting together that initial set of recommendations of the policy committee. I think it's a, a great start. I think one of the things we should also be encouraging the city to do is to continue and also to expedite 
the build out of kind of separate infrastructure for wheeled mobility, you know, bikes and scooters. Um, I would love to see you know, that as a part of any package of recommendation to put in. Thank you. Aileen, all you. Awesome, thank you. Um, I, sorry, I'm stuck at a train station right now. So, so I'm not joining you on uh, the actual Zoom call, but the one thing I just wanted to point out as a point of clarification with all this conversation about um, sidewalk protection and riding on sidewalks and micro mobility on sidewalks is unless I'm unless I'm unaware that the rules have changed. Um, my understanding is that at least with bicycles, you are allowed to ride your bike on the sidewalk. I believe for less than a side or a less than a um, city block length, or there's a specific city, there's a specific length you're allowed to ride um, on a block. To my and my understanding was that that was changed a number of years ago to allow for people to you know access their destination or make a, a you know adjustment in their route. Um, certainly not encouraging continuous sidewalk use, but there is some level of sidewalk use allowed. So I don't know how the city's policy or rules on that would align with um, then the micro mobility uh, detection, sidewalk detection devices. Just, I just don't want us to forget that in some cases, sidewalk writing is allowed. Um, Aileen, this is Tangier. Yeah, this was just specifically for scooters, not bikes. I, that, is, I, and that's, that's thank detection. you for reminding me. Is there is, are scooters? I can't even honestly remember what is allowed for scooters. I can comment briefly on that. There are two areas that times you are allowed to ride on sidewalks. Um, you can ride on the sidewalk if it's part of a designated bike route. You can also ride on the sidewalk if you are parking or um, you know, essentially the, the loading unloading situation. Yeah. And that's applicable to sidewalks. Oh, sorry, do, um, scooters and bikes. That's that's specifically for scooters. Um, bikes actually have some expanded permissions beyond that. Um, scooters were narrowed to just those two cases. Got it. Thank you. We have other comments from the board on the micro mobility recommendations. Yes, uh, sorry, got, got my hand up here. The um, two things, one briefly, apologies for those um, viewing the meeting here that can't see these. I've been trying to get them up to display, but I'm having some difficulty sharing my screen. Um, so, so just for like the general public watching, they've, they've heard us describe it, but, but aren't seeing what we're talking over, which is probably a little confusing. Um, did want to call out one of my comments on this I, I left in the document. I'm personally not a fan of including the training recommendation. To clarify for those who can't see, um, this is a recommendation that the companies provide, uh, let's say, monthly training in a central and visible location re like regarding how to ride these scooters and bikes safely. My commentary here is, is essentially that we're having vendors, we would be suggesting vendors spend time and money on educational efforts that I expect won't have an impact. Um, it feels a lot like some of the state spending on state DOT spending on driver education efforts that don't prove to move the needle on safe driving behavior. And I'd much rather see these organizations, the vendors use this time and money to spend on the more expensive street level corral builds or other things where I think that there will be a high impact per dollar. Um, totally separately, like this is anecdotal, but I have had friends who have been injured on scooters and there's just no way they would have attended a scootering class. Like if would, they wouldn't have done it, it wouldn't have helped them, it wouldn't have prevented their situation. Um, they were injured by surprise or by being struck by someone else riding a different vehicle. Um, so in, in all this sense, recognizing that there is, there are like two to three patients a day injured uh, showing up to Denver Health, I don't really think like spending money on these sort of awareness campaigns for the scooter riders would be an effective use of the money. I'd rather see them spending it on things like the corral parking or, you know, helping support the development of safe separated routes. So something else along those lines. Thank you for that input, Jonathan. I, I don't think there's really, there's no silver bullet to any of these uh, recommendations. 
uh, I think it has to be a combination of all. And even if the education only affected 10% of the population, I think that would be a success. I think it's just changing the behavior, uh, maybe getting to some of the younger drivers. I know as a parent, if I was, if my teenagers wanted to start using it and I saw that opportunity for training, I would definitely influence them to, to go and learn. Um, so again, I don't think any of these individually are, is a silver bullet, but I think as a combination, I think it works. I had a comment. Hello? Go ahead, Joe. Hello? Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Joe. Oh, Sorry. hi. <laughs> I can appreciate your concern about training, but training is very, very, very important. And while we realize that many of the users of our bicycles and scooters are predominantly young, there are some seasoned people <laughs> who would like to have the training. I, for one, have been in the Denver metropolitan area, and I had to get to the courthouse. And unfortunately, not knowing what courthouse I really needed to get to for whatever it is that I need to do, I saw a scooter. And I couldn't figure out how to use it at all. Or a bike. I, you know, it's, it's just not black and white. And so training is very 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 important and i also believe that if people know better they will do better in addition as far as the types of things that are happening on our sidewalks in violation of just courtesy perhaps we could form something out of maybe the the police department of some kind of patrol that they could hand out some fines or just basically have some some set out of that particular organization where they could uh, patrol the streets and ensure that some of these things are being resolved and and uh, taken care of right there on the spot and realizing that that would be pretty taxing on Denver Police Department. But I think that there there can be a way by which they could do that without a great deal of uh, of effort and increase in 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 um in funds there's other means by which they can actually do that i wanted to also ask as far as the bikes and scooters are they going to be available in uh, any of the other um, communities such as montbello green valley ranch some of the other areas here in denver will they and if they are we are going to need the training But that's all. I, I don't know specifically about locations, Joni. I, I do know on our last call, Stephen Riho, the direct, the manager of the program, had had indicated that they have policies about loading them in certain zones based on equity requirements that they have with the city to put them in certain neighborhoods. Um, I, I think we still we also out of that meeting, if I'm remembering correctly, requested additional information about how they were choosing to to enforce that equity thing. So I think it's a at this moment, it's a bit of an open-ended question, I think, for this board that, that's still awaiting an answer. Um, and then I do know, um, specifically, we also did hear maybe the meeting before you joined, Joni, that uh, there is a uh, Montbello-specific bike sharing program as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Of course. So is there anybody from the policy group, Joe, uh, Jake, that'd like to kind of wrap this up and before we vote? Well, um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we, we looked at sort of the main issues and obviously there's some pros and cons to everything, but we think, as Jamie said, it's pretty well-rounded in what we're trying to do. And maybe, you know, the education doesn't have to be the same period or something, but as I think everybody's saying, there's gotta be some kind of training or some availability of training and maybe stress it a little more. And it's not just so much that the people taking it, but I think if everybody in the city knew a lot about what would happen with the, with the cycles, uh, bicycles and scooters, then maybe there'd be a little more peer pressure. So when someone drops their bike in the middle of the sidewalk, the person next to them say, hey, you can't do that. You gotta put it somewhere else. So I think that's good and, and probably 
again, to repeat what Jamie said, once you start these corrals, I agree, that's got to be the primary thing. But then I think everything's got to follow uh, in its kind. So I, I like the list. It could be a lot more involved, and, but I think it's a good start. So, Lucia, Gary, do you have any comments before we wrap up? None here. I Thank think you guys did a great job. I missed the last policy meeting, so. You still provide a lot of good input. Thank you, Lucia. Gary? Okay. I think you had just uh, to round things out. I do. I do think this is a really good start. Um, I do. I do appreciate your input, Joni, on the um, enforcement component. I do think that that is something that um, I, I think personally we've <laughs> we're I think about to enter our third year of the scooters in some form or another in relatively different programs um, of existence, but. Um, I know the department has taken the opinion that we're still in an education phase, um, but I think, I think personally, this isn't necessarily the thought of the policy committee, but I do think maybe step B on this is to encourage the department that at this point there are, we're, we're seeing real world impacts, both in the, the crash data that the hospitals are providing, as well as uh, really anecdotal life experiences that, that may may lean towards enforcement being a more realistic um, next step rather than continue co like continually considering this purely an educational phase that would be maybe a, a thought for me on round two jake i wanted to ask the staff do, do they find any of these recommendations prohibitive is there anything that sticks out do you go oh that's not going to work or any comment from staff Do I don't believe we have anyone specific to the team working on the scooters on the line, so it might yeah. we might not have a direct response. Okay. So, uh, as the chair of the policy committee, I recommend that these uh, recommendations uh, be. Uh, I'll put them in the form of a letter and ask your permission to pass this on um, to Dottie officially. I guess I have a quick question about that. Just, just. For, to, to resolve any confusion, we'd sent out a version of this document for people to comment on. That is where Tangier added her section on transit integration. There were a couple of other comments from Julie and I, including a couple requests for edits or clarifications around what is and what is not allowed. Um, so I, I guess, what, which version of this are we voting on? Are we, are, are we voting on like the version I'm showing on my screen or is there gonna be like another version we'd wanna clean up to send? Um, well, we talked about earlier, uh, the transit integration, uh, that has to be vetted. So that would be dropped and I can make any uh, other edits that were available that don't change the purpose of the statement. So, okay. So your request, we vote on a version of this that does not include transit integration, um, does not edit the training segment, um, probably only includes the edit around clarifying when someone can or can't ride on a sidewalk, just to Correct. be more specific. Correct. Okay. Correct. I'd like to request that we wait to see that final language before a vote. We actually, with the, for our bylaws, we, we can actually pretty easily do that. Um, Jamie, if you want to put together the final language, we can vote on this electronically, like just in the next week or so. If you just send out a, if we send out a poll, say like, hey, do you approve this new language? I think that's good. I, I wouldn't want to wait another month considering all the work the panel did or oh. policy committee did. So totally. yeah, I can get that out tomorrow and uh, appreciate all the input that was given to us. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Jamie. Um, and just double checking, Johnny, did you have a question or comment? Is no, I don't know why my hand is not down. I, there we go. Okay, no worries. I just want to make sure. Oh, here we go. <laughs> now I can get to my out. screen and say lower hand. Okay, I'm good. <laughs> All right, perfect. All right, um, unless there are any other comments on the micro mobility recommendations, uh, we'll go ahead and move to our community report section. Um, for this section, the purpose of this is for board members to share what they're hearing from their communities. 
i.e. the districts they're, they're representing or the communities that they've been appointed to uh, if they are not district specific. Um, what concerns, questions, and needs they are hearing from the parts of towns that they represent. So um, kind of ask to keep this between one to three minutes per person um, to keep us on, on track for today. But um, I guess uh, best practice for this one be raise your hand if, you, if you're ready to um, leave your comments from your community and I'll call on you in order. All right, Paul. You know, one of the things that I brought up in my community is um, uh, as almost everyone from every corner of Denver, I'm sure is aware Denver has been on a multi-year plan to replace um, pedestrian signaling and traffic signaling at uh, first at major intersections and now pretty much at any intersection that has a light. And one of the things I've noticed is there's a couple intersections in town where Doty has laid down the new infrastructure essentially behind to on top of or right next to the existing infrastructure uh, with a multi-week if not month overlap in um, removing old infrastructure, which can temporarily create situations where you have effectively uh, uh, non-operational lights sitting within inches of regular lights, which, you know, I, I know the city like the back of my hand, I know these intersections well, but visually it's uh, incredibly confusing at times. I um, reached out to my city council person and had them kind of push that request through to Doty specifically, the intersection I was concerned about was Downing and Evans, um, but I bring that up as an issue um, going forward. Just, you know, I know the logistical difficulties involved in replacing aging infrastructure around, but if uh, potentially the organization can avoid the overlap of new and old, because I, I effectively watched two or three cars run a turn light uh, because it was pretty visually difficult to distinguish which light was active. So that's that's my pulpit at the moment. Thank you, Paul. Lucia? Yeah, so my question is, um, or my feedback that I've got is, I'm on a group in my neighborhood, Baker, called uh, this basically the Baker Support Network. And we're out there trying to support businesses on Broadway and support um, homeless people, basically, who are in the area. And by you know providing food pantries, what can we do just as a local neighborhood? And one of the things that we've been pushing for is a public bathroom. Um, which we've got, or it's allegedly coming at Ellsworth and Broadway on the west side of, El of Broadway uh, and on the uh, north side of Ellsworth. And the only issue allegedly that's holding it back is that these portable bathrooms, these mobile bathrooms, which the city I think already has two others, they have to be staffed the whole time they're there. And uh, like many places, there's no, availability for staffing. So it was pointed out to me something that Colorado Springs has done and they have now in one of their parks, uh, I can't remember the name of the park right off hand starts with the letter B, um, has a self-cleaning bathroom that uh, doesn't require staffing. Um, you know, you go in the bathroom, you get 10 minutes to do your business and it gives you a countdown as you get close to the end. And then after that, it opens the door. So whether you're done or not, uh, to uh, kind of keep down on the loitering, which has been a problem. And they're individual stalls. Um, so uh, to me, that seems like a, a good solution. I think the same kind of bathroom was installed in uh, North Hollywood in California. Uh, the company that they use is this company out of New Zealand, although there are, I'm sure, other companies that do these. And while there may be an initial capital outlay for this type of facility, I we think like in the long run, you're saving on labor costs. And um, I said I would bring it to this group to see if you know we can get Dottie to move more towards uh, self-cleaning bathrooms that don't require staffing to deal with the public the the basically the public nuisance of, of of people defecating on our streets and sidewalks 
Thank you, Lucia. Uh, Joe? Thank you. Uh, in my district, I guess one of the things is there are programs uh, uh, <clears throat> funded or happening or whatever, but we have no idea actually when they're going to get implemented. One is uh, along 13th and 14th between Colorado and uh, as far, I guess, east as you can go. And so they're just wondering just how maybe this group can kind of get some kind of update from 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 Dottie is kind of what's what's happening, what isn't and all that, because, again, they believe that it's underway, but there's been no progress. So everybody's kind of wondering, hey, when are you when are you going to start work on it? So I don't know if there's some way for us to be informed of that from Dottie, but it would be nice. So that's my question. Thank you, Joe. Um, on my screen, I'm next. So I'll I'll go ahead and uh, promote myself uh, at the moment. Um, so for I represent District 10, and I think from District 10, we're seeing four issues that I can and basically continuously hearing from the community. Um, some of these are basically since the moment of my appointment, I've gotten numerous uh, communications from them. I think without a doubt in District 10, the thing that we hear the most is uh, right-of-way enforcement. Um, things in the right-of-way, cars and bike lanes, objects and tree lawns, utility companies parked on sidewalks, utility companies parked on uh, private property, uh, utility companies uh, occupying some space and refusing to provide a permit or indicate that they have the right to be there um, and, uh, and not moving when, when refusing to provide one. Um, also companies putting up no parking signs without any seeming authority. Um, and for example, in, in Capitol Hill, I got a lot of communication about one uh, utility company that put up no parking signs on uh, about uh, 12 city blocks and left them there for an entire month, um, which is, um, if you've ever seen the parking situation in Capitol Hill, that's not, that did not go over very well. Um, and there was a lot of um, uh, intuitive citizens that came up with their own solution on uh, how to remove those uh, signs, as you can imagine. Um, so uh, I would say that Without a doubt, um, broadly, right of way enforcement in District 10 is the thing that I hear from uh, from residents, and and I'm I'm not exaggerating when I say I get a get a communication, uh, if not daily, at least every other day about the right of way enforcement issues in in the District 10 area. Um, the with that paired closely is sidewalk access, particularly in Golden Triangle near. Um, construction sites and developments. I know last a uh, couple of meetings ago we got um, communication on the detour program. Um, I think there are still quite a few sites in particularly the Golden Triangle neighborhood that's causing a lot of pain as that's a high uh, pedestrian trafficked neighborhood uh, where um, some of these grandfathered in projects are causing a lot of communal pain um, and requests directly to the development companies have gone kind of unheeded. Um, thirdly, and sorry, these are the ones I'm actually in <laughs> my community, so I apologize if I'm taking too much time, but Vision Zero concerns are, are, are increasing actually for me and how often I'm hearing them, particularly speeding, um, widespread reports of uh, red light traffic running, uh, and, and even vehicles that are stopping at red lights, acknowledging that they know they're red and then they're going anyway. Um, as well as uh, the sidewalk scooter riding that we've heard about a lot. Um, these are these are ones that are making people feel unsafe that I'm hearing about a lot. And then lastly, uh, trash pickup situation in Co Congress Park. Um, the uh, for for those that are unaware, uh, in Congress Park, there's been some pain around uh, trash pickup has moved from the alleys to the front of the homes for for that neighborhood. I, I believe that neighborhood exclusively. Um, and so it's been causing some pain, especially on some of the hills. I, I, my understanding is that they, uh, the, the trash cans are basically uh, getting a mind of their own and rolling down the hills and things. Um, so uh, some issues with that as well. But those are the four things from District 10 we're hearing, right-of-way enforcement, sidewalk access, vision zero concerns, and then trash pickup. So thank you. Alan. Thanks, Jake. Um, here in District 1 on the north side, anecdotally and speaking with folks in the RNOs and communities, we hear a lot of requests for very um, simple things, crosswalks, more stop signs, 
Um, a lot of that, similar to what Jake said, related to seeing a lot of speeding in the neighborhood, um, want more safe infrastructure for people to be able to walk, lack of sidewalks. Um, also in some of the business centers, places like 32nd and Lowell and, and Tennyson would love some more safe ways for people to cross the street due to speeding issues there and people want to be able to patronize the businesses, but sometimes feel unsafe walking, biking, or taking transit to get there. Um, and then other major concerns are our arterial streets that border us, um, Sheridan, Colfax, Federal, serious concerns about safety there as well, um, of just being able to cross them, people speeding, um, street racing, things like that. And then um, last of all, just general concerns about safe route to schools for, for children in the neighborhood. I've heard um, and, and met with a few neighborhood residents that they would like um, there to be safer access around the schools, again, more crosswalks, um, median refuges, other things like that, that would be helpful for people just to, for helpful for their kids just to get to school. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Alan, Christopher. I'm happy to go. Um, let's see. So speeding has been brought up several times in my conversations with my neighbors and the folks that live here, um, especially on Central Park and Mar Martin Luther King Boulevard. Um, great concern is the traffic um, that is going to be generated from several construction projects that are in um, or underway uh, in, in District 8. We've got a great deal of work going on north of 70 and south of 70 on Central Park. Um, there's also, um, you know, issues I'm sure that are uh, in other neighborhoods, the same um, concerns about maintenance of traffic during construction. And then I thought most interestingly, there were two uh, uh, repeating concerns about the bike lanes being uh, separated. Um, I'm a fan, a lot of people are fans. It's, it's taking a little bit of uh, getting used to, but what we're, uh, what we're seeing is a lot of cars uh, on the separated, uh, parked cars on the separated bike lanes are pushing their way in to the hatched uh, area between where the parking spot is and the riding lane because they're fearful of opening their doors in the oncoming traffic and getting clipped. So, um, you know, I guess the observation from that is that uh, it really has to be uh, gene, 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 geometrically um, uh, feasible to do these lanes uh, because people are going to, to push in uh, onto the bikers. That's what I've heard, thank you. Thanks, Christopher. Joni? First of all, I want to say on behalf of uh, District 11, it appears that we're pretty excited about the expansion of 56th Avenue. And we just want to know if that project is on schedule. And are there any concerns um, regarding the, the current process of the, of the project? Does anyone know? Did anyone hear me? We heard you, Joni. Um, okay. I don't know if yes, you have yes. Well, um, I hear you, Joni. This is Michelle. Okay. Um, but there isn't anyone on on for Dottie right now. But I think what we're doing is just cumulating all the questions and the feedback from everyone, and then we'll put a whole large list, and then um, come back, have people come back and report. But thank you. Okay. The other thing uh, is that I I, I know uh, this is only my second month, but I hear a lot. Uh, from some people here uh, regarding the street barriers that were put down in, in Mont Bell and some places in, in uh, Green Valley Ranch. And, and I, I, I guess I, I don't know the purpose of the, the street barriers. Uh, can someone help me out on that? Or you want to talk with me offline? Or how can I gain more information about the purpose of uh, having those, those barriers on, uh, on the streets? Michelle, is that something we can put on the same list and get back to Joni on? 
Yes, yes, please. And, 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 and everything also else that everyone's bringing up, this is a great time for us to get community feedback and we'll put it on a list and we'll start targeting the people that, that we can get in front of um, the advisory board to be able to answer those questions. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joni. Thank you, hey, Michelle, Michelle. It's Earl here as well. Also, um, I think with just queuing up the questions and listing them up, we could probably get a more um, comprehensive answer on a lot of these, particularly this last one as well. So definitely sounds great. Thanks, Earl. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you, Earl and Michelle. Julie? Thanks. Um, I, you know, everything I've heard, I, I agree with, um, particularly the speeding and um, and the bathroom thing was, I didn't know there was such a thing as self-cleaning bathrooms. Um, and I don't, so I have two things. One is I don't know if it's, uh, if, if this is even in what Dodie does, but when people are talking about the trash, um, there seems to be confusion in the parks of what you do in do like around dog poop. Um, and like where, like there, I know in our neighborhood, like there aren't signs um, there. I noticed there are ba like bags given in some neighborhoods, but not in, not in our district. Um, and so like there is this one place where I thought you're supposed to put it. And then some guy who was worked for the city said, oh no, that's not where you're supposed to put it. That's where bags are supposed to go. So it would just be good to tell people um, a lot of the parks don't have, um, some of the parks do not have even trash cans or not many. Um, and then the other thing, which I don't think is, is in any way unique to District 9 is, and, and I don't, again, I don't know where Doty inter intersects with RTD, but we've just been doing some work on the, you know, people not feeling safe on the RTD buses um, you know, there was that stabbing and that was, I believe in district 10, um, or somewhere on Colfax a few weeks ago. And I think the drivers aren't feeling safe and not feeling supported. So I don't know if there's anything we can do, but I'm just kind of talking about it everywhere I go, because I think it's, it's a community wide issue. And if we don't have, if we don't have transit, if people, if choice riders don't take trans, don't want to take transit, you know, they might get out of their cars a little bit for August, but they're not going to stay on it. And if we don't have the choice riders, we're not going to have the ridership that will get service back up to where it needs to be because it's still at pre-pandemic levels. They still have a staffing problem, all of that. So I just think it, that it needs to be taken as a community issue of how do we make transit work for everyone? Because as long as it's just the people who have to be on the bus, which is you know, mostly low income, older and disabled people and the drivers, that isn't enough, I think, for the government to about to make it work well. So we need those choice riders if we want, and if we want the environment to work, transit has to work. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, Gary Johnson. Gary, do we still have you on the line? All right. <laughs> I think we still have you on mute, Gary. Gary, I think you're up, but I think you're muted. I, I, I understand I'm muted. But can oh, you hear now. me now? Okay. Yep, we can hear you. Oh, okay, good. My, my, uh, my little microphone shut up. But anyway, I uh, um, was interested in hearing several of you, uh, Paul, Jake, Alan, um, Christopher, uh, to a degree, mention uh, pedestrians. And I think uh, in light of Vision Zero, um, there ought to be a focus amongst the many other things that Dottie does, but nonetheless a focus on the uh, upgrading and or application of appropriate uh, measures, uh, mitigation measures that uh, crosswalks. And, and specifically in District 2, I know of one such crosswalk, uh, crosswalk that uh, is a very mysterious uh, situation at, um, on Grant Ranch uh, Boulevard. And, um, but again, it, 
uh, if there's one instance, and I'm, you've all mentioned several others, that I think it would be wise to encourage an inventory. Um, I know you can go to uh, the Boulder website uh, and you can see every uh, crosswalk is shown on a GIS uh, mapping um, and the current situation for each one of those. So uh, I think if I were not to make it too much, uh, pedestrian crosswalk um, issues, uh, I would like to have that addressed now and in the near future, and I'd be more than happy um, to lend any expertise I have in, the, in that regard. Um, just in real quick, lastly, I, uh, I am very interested in the budget, and I know that we're in a process of, of, um, of developing the budget for next year, but I'm also very interested to see how the progress has been over the last year in meeting that budget. And I would hope that, that some of that information might be uh, available. So, and I'll leave it at that, and I'll continue to watch my microphone. <laughs> thanks, Gary. Jonathan? Yes, hey, thanks. Um, although I am a mayoral appointee, as we don't currently have a District 3 member, I figure I should probably report out on what I'm hearing in District 3 from uh, community members at meetings, RNOs, et cetera. Um, largely to keep it brief, um, echoing a lot of what I've heard from Gary and Alan and others around um, wanting more crosswalks, wanting more stop signs. And as a key part of that, a lot of frustration with not knowing where to go next with their hyper-local issues um, about specific crosswalks, about specific stop signs, about specific items requested here. Um, they'll reach out and say, be told, I, you should reach out to 311. They'll reach out to 311 and have their case closed with a message that, you know, this, this intersection doesn't meet standards for a crosswalk or something along those lines. And then they don't know where to go next because they're saying, well, then I, clearly the, the standards aren't very good. Who do I complain to about the standards? But they're not given the name of the standards. You can't respond to 311 cases that are closed, um, et cetera. Um, but, and, and with those standards, a lot of frustration around what they at least by rumor have heard they are. They'll, you know, they've heard in a meeting, well, not enough people have been injured here uh, for that, or not enough people cross here. But they say, how do you know how many people cross here? No one's ever out here measuring it. Um, so, you know, we're we're somewhat of like transportation or infrastructure nerds here in this room. We probably know a little bit about more about how to direct um, our complaints, concerns, research standards a little bit more. But just for the folks who are just members of the neighborhood and don't, you know, dive into this on a regular basis, mm -hmm. they're just really confused as to to where to go next um, because three one one is what they're always told, and it doesn't seem to meet meet the needs that they're asking for. May I do a quick follow-up? Um, if, if you don't mind. Sure, Gary, go ahead. Okay, um, I'm gonna quickly share my screen. I'm hopeful that, um, okay. And that's fine, I understand that we're disabled, but but I will wanna direct you to a document that- uh, Gary, you can, you can share it now. I oh, just made okay. you a co-host. Thank you mm -hmm. uh, very much, uh, and I will. Um, screen. This is a document that was prepared in 2016, if you all can see it. Uh, City and County of Denver has a guideline uh, for uncontrolled pedestrian crossings. This is a 22-page document that goes into some very specific mitigation measures that can be applied in an incremental basis, uh, since there are an awful lot of, of uh, tools that can be applied uh, to pedestrian crossings. And uh, this would basically be the document, uh, Jonathan, that is being referenced <laughs> or, and, and or Dottie is, is using um, possibly. But um, just to let you know, this, this can be found on the website should you be interested in looking for it and uh, this is something that i'd like to pursue in the in, in the near future so, and i'm i'm done now i gotta figure out if I unshare can you take me and unshare all right thanks gary ginger hi everyone 
I would like to echo hearing, so I'm at large, um, I'm not representing one specific district, um, but concerns about speeding. And I'm curious, as I was doing the participatory budgeting um, exercise, like last week, it was all about um, mobility. And I found myself wondering about 13th and 14th avenues. And I've talked about it with my immediate neighbors, not not at a neighborhood level yet, but 13th and 14th are one ways. And I live just east of Colorado Boulevard. And it just doesn't seem like we're at a place where we need to get cars in and out of downtown as quickly as possible anymore. And I'm wondering if Dottie has had conversations about turning 13th and 14th into two ways. Um, I'd be very interested in that conversation. People travel at very high speeds. They crash into electric poles. We have electricity outages, all that fun stuff. Um, yeah, I just think if we actually are gonna meet our vision zero goals, we have to do some things to slow down cars. So yeah, I'm 13th and 14th. I've talked to people about it, wondering if it's they, they are up for consideration for making them two ways. Thank you, Tangier. Aileen? Hi, thanks everyone for your patience with my mobile attendance earlier. Um, I think in my neighborhood, uh, I'm just going to reiterate it, uh, the speed of cars and how aggressive cars are. Um, Hamden goes right through my neighborhood and there continue to be a lot of um, auto versus auto and auto versus pedestrian or bicyclist uh, crash um, in that corridor. So lots of concerns about that. Um, also, I think that more anecdotally than anything I've seen um, in the last couple of years, a big increase, at least in my neighborhood of kids using bikes um, and uh, their own two feet to get to school. And so a lot of um, a lot more parents interested in sending their kids to school that way. And I'm seeing more and more um, kids getting to school that way. And so definitely a lot of concerns about that. The same time, I, I'm hearing from my neighbors about a lot of questions about why does why is there why are there so many bollards? Um, well, they don't say bollards because they don't know that's what they're called, but the plastic posts in the street. Um, and this is on a neighborhood bikeway that just got installed in my neighborhood in the last year. And a, it took the project took a really long time. And I live in a neighborhood, and I cannot honestly say that um, I received any communication from Dottie about the project, um, like to my neighborhood so that me and my neighbors knew exactly what it was. And so I was left def defending the project and without having any information. And so uh, my neighbors keep asking questions, why are those bollards up there? And why did they pick these intersections? And they took away the parking and this, I, I can't do a proper turn now at this intersection because of the bollards and the, the concrete curb. and um, I wish I just knew more uh, so I could answer their questions. And um, not that I, I think overall the project is, these projects are good, but more information would be really helpful so that I could be on Team Dottie a little bit more effectively than I am today. So that's it. Thank you, Aileen. Uh, Tangier, sorry, did you have another comment? No, I forgot to put my hand down. <laughs> <laughs> no worries. Sorry. Um, just wanted to make sure I was hearing everyone. Um, I don't know if we still have anyone just on the phone. Um, that is all the hands I've seen. If there was someone that I missed either because they're on the phone or they were unable to hit the raise hand button, uh, now's your time. All right, just put my hand up. I just want to kind of call out attention to uh, when we have construction, it's kind of the lack of accommodations that are created for sidewalk and bike access. Um, I would just love for us to formalize a recommendation to the city that required construction projects to accommodate pedestrians and cyclists. I agree. That was a powerful hand raise and comment. So thank you, Brian. Anyone else that we may have missed? All right. Um, hearing none, um, wanted to go ahead and shift to our next agenda topic. 
Um, so for our next agenda topic, we have our operations overview. Um, so the purpose of this discussion is to discuss what is the board, the, what of this board's current format and structure is working for you, what is not working well, and what is not as optimized as it could be. Um, potential areas of review could be the standing agenda, committee structure, or anything else that you would like to raise. I think uh, we are now at a good point in our time existing as a board that we have a good feel for how things are working under the structure that we created when we created our bylaws um, and some of our initial um, meeting structure, but want to make sure that we're getting a good understanding of how to best utilize these meetings to serve uh, the purpose of the citizens of our of our city, um, as well as the needs of our board to communicate and uh, advocate for those citizens. So a um, bit of an open discussion here as well, um, but uh, let us know what you think is working and or not working um, for how we have these meetings formatted. Jake, this is uh, Jamie. Um, I'm just curious when we do have public uh, comment, uh, is Dottie getting back to these people? I know sometimes I've reached out to them to answer a question or or uh, show them appreciation for this uh, for their willingness to step up. So I'm just curious how that communication link works between Dottie and uh, public speakers. Uh, appreciate that, Jamie. I know I know that's come up before. Um, I, th I think my understanding was that was the goal of having the community engagement subcommittee. I don't know if that committee has met yet, so I'm hoping that um, when they meet, they can come back with a recommendation. Um, I don't know if anyone from that committee had any comments, um, but I do agree that this is a constant topic with any public comment is is how are, how are citizens being responded to. Jake, can I jump in here? Mm -hmm. um, and I also see Julie's questions basically, well, not the same, but very similar, like how do people know to contact us? So I think if, if I could propose the community engagement committee to come up with a process that how, how people can get to you guys, if you want, that means you'll have to give your emails and I can post them um, on the website, which is what Prab does or it can come to the Dottie. Anyway, we have to decide a, for a way to, for people to get feedback to you and then us get feedback out. And the and we're waiting on the community engagement committee to come up with a process. So to, what it, what that looks like. So what would happen is if there's a feedback to from for this, this would be, let's say somebody said, what's up with this sidewalk at this intersection? That question is the Dottie advisory board. And so what we would do is, Dottie, you got, we would get the answer from Dottie, we come back to Dottie Advisory Board, and then your mechanism would be how to respond to them. If that makes sense. Yeah, I agree. Um, I know Alicia's out. I don't know if we, do we have another member of the community engagement team on the line today? I don't know if I have the committee membership pulled up. I'm technically on the community engagement committee. <laughs> All right, Tangier, would you be willing to, as our as our representative, would you be willing to add that to our, the next community engagement sync? I will, and then I'm seeing um, an email from Alicia from kind of the end of July, so I will make it a point to follow up with her and a couple other people on here. Great, thank you very much, Lucia. Hi. Uh, first, I just want to say how much I have enjoyed seeing the babies on the screen. They bring my heart joy. Thank you for sharing your family in this meeting. <laughs> Jonathan and Kendra. Um, So, oh my God, he's adorable. Anyway, um, my boys are in college and they're not feeding. Um, <laughs> But anyway, my topic is, you know, I would like to hear from other committee members. So far, I've only ever heard from the policy committee and I would like to hear from operations and from finance and, and communications. Um, I, I know that they haven't been able to meet for various reasons, but I would really, you know, I, I would really like to hear from these other committees. And that's all I've got to say. Jonathan? 
Yeah, so on the topic of, of committees, I think the, the the larger question here is, I mean, I think what we're seeing is a couple of committees were formed and like took to a task and for completed some task or project or something along those lines. Um, finance was very timely, getting some recommendations out for our budget. Um, others have met, but haven't, you know, had any sort of, I guess, like fruitful results. Others haven't met yet. I think this opens the question for me of, is our committee structure viable? Is it working for us? Like we don't, we, we don't have to have this committee structure that we have today. We've tried it for like seven months. This was our first attempt. Our bylaws do allow for both standing committees and ad hoc committees. It does not require that we have either. Um, I was talking to Brian a little bit about this before. He's got a lot of experience on MBAC and others where what some, some things have worked, some haven't. We took, we chose back in, I think it was December or January to set up five committees and split everyone across those committees and assign everyone to a committee. But we could instead say, hey, we only have two or three committees and anyone we, we and we have a chair for each to make sure that the meetings happen but anyone can join as few or as many of those committees as they would like to like make sure that they can be engaged in the topics they want to be engaged in not in the ones they're not alternatively we could have no standing committees and then only have ad hoc committees when something comes up like we have a lot of commenters coming through and talking about the right of way enforcement instead of saying let's assign that out to operations or assign that out to policy or something we can say who wants to raise their hand and dive into this issue and come back with a recommendation for us in two months and then you know committee disbanded something along those lines so i think i'd open the question to the group of like is this i mean like instead of saying hey like tanger and and you all, do you want to follow up on this topic as a community engagement team? Do we want a community engagement committee? Like, do we want a policy committee? Or would it be better to, instead of having like a policy finance projects operations set of committees say, hey, we want to talk about I-25 and South Broadway and have a group of people raise their hands and consider the policy, the project, the operations and the finance of that one project, um, something along those lines. So. Just a few ideas out there. Um, I'm, I'm just wondering if our committee structure is even working. If folks are not feeling motivated to meet, if they're not feeling motivated to like engage in some ways, then, then I think it's probably not working for us. So we should probably reassess how we're structured. Um, don't need to take that. Don't need to take that path. But my two cents. Aileen. So. Um dot advisory board confessional time uh have not had an operations committee meeting paul and Wilkin. this is both of our mutual confession time partly because i've had a really crazy summer and then at the same time when i've gotten the emails of like hey are you guys going to have a meeting i didn't know what we were supposed to meet about <laughs> and i think that come i i would kind of support jonathan's suggestion um i mean if this committee today can say this is what operations committee needs to ch chat about and say aileen and paul you guys need to meet and this is what we want you to look into and come back to us at such and such date with a report awesome um but i think we could be maybe more responsive um i, I guess if that's not the case then i would say i can be more motivated personally and feel like I'm contributing more to something that actually needs attention, be more response, we can be more responsive collectively as a committee if we kind of go the route of Jonathan and, and perhaps there's a middle ground. Um, but yeah, like uh, I, I can't remember all the reasons why, but I think it's because I didn't submit a request in time. I got assigned to operations and now I'm not really sure what we're supposed to do. And I totally take fault for that. But if we can't sit here today and say, Aileen and Paul, you guys have to work on this, um, then maybe that's telling us part of our answer. Jonathan? Sorry, uh, baby hit the raise hand. <laughs> um, that's that's a better skill than, than many people on many Zoom meetings. So uh, impressive. Um, I think that um, I I do agree. I think I think the conversation of how our subcommittees are working is is probably um, one that we really need to dive into uh, quite a bit. Um, I think that um, 
what has worked well for the policy committee, um, being a member of that committee, is that we set a monthly cadence. Um, that is something I'd probably recommend to every committee um, because then we, like this meeting, just know when it is every month. Um, and, and then I think there's uh, probably some things that um, maybe we should review with each committee and the purpose of each committee. Um, I, I think that we had established like an initial list of committees and then the purpose of each committee. Um, and I think that the thought being that for some of those committees, it would be very um, clear, right? Like the budget and finance committee, it's like pretty clear that the budget and finance, like the upcoming budget announcements, right? Are something that they need to be paying attention to, right? And creating purpose around for, for policy, we knew that, you know, we were seeing things with, you know, both the right of way and some of the scooter rules um, and, and came to address them. I do think that um, at some level, we probably do need each committee to have some ability to set its own goals um, as, as kind of what is seen in that area and then come back with some commentary from that committee to the whole board on, on things that they're seeing in this area. Um, and then we can have a bigger conversation about that. Um, and then I do think the other way that information is going in these committees is right as particular topics are coming up either in public comment or as we discuss them, um, they're, they're going to committees. I know we had viewed the community engagement as a bit of a committee that would help us route some of that as well as create structure around how we collect information. Um, but I think maybe it does revolve uh, you know, a review if a committee's not meeting because they don't know what they should be meeting about, maybe let's have a conversation about the purpose of that committee and see if we can come up with something that's that's uh, that fits more as a goal and can have be kind of self sustaining as having its own goals as a committee. So that would be some of my initial thoughts. Joe? Yeah, um, I don't think, yeah, it should be either or. And I like the standing committee and obviously. I think we've gotten some stuff done on the policy and everybody's worked hard to, to do that, but it actually hasn't taken that much time, although maybe Jamie has put an ordinate amount of time, but I, I like that. And then when special projects come up, I agree with Jonathan, then because they involve all these groups, maybe there is just a, a project by project committee that, work, that works on it. But I mean, I think if you're going to be on this board, you got to really contribute on the, on the <clears throat> committee level. And that should be, all of us should pledge that, that we're gonna do what we can. And if we don't think the committee we're on is kind of, it lacks purpose or something like that, then let's reformulate, let's reshuffle the deck and all that. But I kind of like to see that. And I'd like to know that the outreach community is, is reaching out at least to themselves, if not more people, because the policy committee would love, I think, to have some information out the community of what policies we're setting. So. And we can all work together. Just we, we got to give it a little bit more effort. I guess that's what I'm saying. And I like to keep both uh, standing committees, but then also form ad hoc committees to really focus on certain specific projects. Sorry, uh, Tanger, I forgot my role as co-chair here for a second. There, you're up next. <laughs> I what was I going to say? Um... Let's see. I completely forgot what I was gonna say. Uh, something. Yeah, timing has been like I. I have a. I some. I also struggle with a little bit of direction. Granted, the, you know, we could come up with our own direction, but the community engagement committees often, I feel, on the boards and commissions struggle with you know direction. Um, it's it. It's, I think it will be easy enough for us to, you know, make some recommendations around how the public gets a hold of us. Um, that's one. And then two, the other thing is, right, how Dottie staff uh, gets back to those who make public comment. Um, because I definitely think that needs to get flushed out. Like we need, we need to know how that's working um so i'm happy to work on that i'm yeah alan um this is something i brought up a while ago but i wanted to bring it up again in light of the new council meeting times um just want to throw out maybe 
in the new year or or in subsequent months from now that we could look at a potential new time since council is meeting around now and i know i've heard from several city council members including um, mine that they would love to be able to either listen or occasionally comment here and our current time does not work um, day and time does not work well with that so just one idea but love everything that i've heard from the group so far um i was actually going to talk about something totally different alan but i couldn't agree more um i would definitely echo that thought um i do I would put that in my category of things not working for this meeting to be totally honest. I think we are, uh, we have, I've heard clear interest from council members as well in attending this meeting. Um, and it, you know, I think it's, um, I think they're being very polite about the fact that they don't love our current time. Um, and I do think we should look at um, adjusting it um, as well as I actually think we're, um, we're actually devaluing ourselves as a board when we come when we're competing head to head with city council. Um, we're going to it's always going to be challenging for us to um, be the event that people maybe choose to make public comment at. Um, if they have a comment that that could go to both city council and our board, um, I, I would say odds are pretty high that um, they're going to go to the city council meeting. So um, I, I do think we should definitely address that. Um, and then I'll hold on my second comment because I do think yours is so important now. And um, I don't know if anyone else has any additions on the timing other than uh, Jonathan seems to be proposing Saturday morning it for four hours. So if that sounds good to everyone, we can just go ahead and get a second on that motion. He probably wants to start at six o'clock in the morning when his baby wakes up on Saturday too. <laughs> I'm awake. I might as well get things done, yeah. <laughs> Any other commentary on timing of the meeting? Just Jake, one more thing, just to make sure that it works with Dottie leadership as well. So we can be respectful of sure. her director Phipps or Nick or anyone else being able to attend as well. Yeah, the, this is Julie. I just wanted to say, I think if, if we change it, like some of us set our calendars out pretty far. So like a uh, like very significant amount of notice and, and I also think maybe if, if committees are expected, and that's totally fine if they are, but I know when I was recruited by my council person, they didn't say, they, they said it was just this meeting. Um, and so I just think if that's an expectation, it might be good to even have a have something in writing that, that would say like, here is the expectation to make sure that people understand. And again, I'm, I'm fine with committee. To me, it's always about scheduling. Like that's always my challenge, but we should just be clear with what those expectations are. Yep. So really quick on that point um, here at Dottie, um, I would, if we're gonna move this meeting, um, I think that uh, initially uh, to the point that was just made, one, we would probably want a little bit more notice. And then two, um, I think that the, since there's so many people um, and stakeholders that are at play that want to um, ultimately get involved and you know participate in this meeting, maybe we start and put out maybe one or two or three options of meeting times. And then we go with um, which times work best or which ultimate time works for best for everyone else. And then that'd be the one that we do. And we probably work to uh, maybe uh, vet that here over the coming weeks. Yeah, I think that makes sense. Um, maybe first a follow-up on this call. Um, maybe Jonathan, you and I can talk about how, how we set up maybe an electronic uh, way of maybe a doodle poll or whatever to kind of get an idea of timing and we'll communicate out to that. I don't think it would be possible to do the September meeting under a new time at this point because we've already committed speakers. So it would at least be um, October or beyond at this point, but um, we definitely, um, if not farther, I don't know how far out our schedule goes online. So we'd have to figure that out, but. Yeah, I'd agree. We should, we should, it should be at least three months out for a recount. Yeah. If not, if not longer, yeah. Perfect. Cool. Um, sorry, Jonathan. Did you have other comments? I saw your hand raised as well. Uh, I did, and I've forgotten it now. So I will raise my lower my hand. <laughs> All right. Um, I think that uh, I would have raised my hand, but I did not. Um, the additional comment I had uh, after Alan that I saved for the meeting time is, I do think that one thing that 
I feel like is not working super well is um, a bit of how this board is interfacing with the department. I don't know if that's a structure of our board versus how we're communicating the department. I think maybe some of the problem is, uh, I think a lot of it's maybe getting funneled directly through NIC and, and I don't know uh, if there's, and, and maybe Michelle, this is something we could work on is, is how do we interface into the department um, in different ways to get questions answered. I think I, th I think we're going to drown Nick if we send everything directly to him. Um, so I don't know if maybe there's someone we should contact for how to route a question or whether we need to look at maybe a different structure for how we're even um, communicating information to um, the Dottie team directly. I, I want to make this something that isn't um, a burden for the Dottie team, but also gives us ways to have um, the, you know, advisory role that that we're intended to. And I, I don't know if others are feeling that same kind of challenge, but I, I think that um, I think we're asking Nick to play too much of quarterback maybe for in, in a way that's that's maybe unfair. <laughs> so else? to add on to that, uh, that's actually a good question um, to uh, bring up and talk about. Um, I think there's an opportunity for both, um, for really uh, me, Michelle and Nick to uh, work or to brainstorm on what that would look like. And I guess maybe on you guys' end, if you guys could probably bucket together, uh, similar to the way you have subcommittees um, on maybe certain items to where, um, you know, if you have a question regarding this particular item, if um, we would potentially want to uh, route to a particular designated person. I personally don't mind if uh, finance related things come to me as a CFO. I think I've had enough engagement with this board to where um, if you wanted to send something to me, I'd definitely be uh, more than willing to uh, run point on that. And so um, I think the intent for Nick and I both being here is to not overburden one single person with um, the items that come to the department as a whole. So um, I think by the time uh, the next meeting, um, when Nick comes back from vacation and he's not underwater here in the next uh, few weeks, uh, him and I can definitely talk about that and see what that will look like for uh, this team here. Perfect. That'd be great, Earl. Um, and maybe it's something as simple as maybe there's like, instead of emailing one of you, there's maybe like a distribution list we could email. And I don't know, there's lots of ideas, but I, I think that's one thing I noticed that that seemed like maybe we weren't as efficient as we could be on how to make that work. Absolutely. Yes, definitely. And actually really quick, I have to jump because I have another meeting here in about four minutes, but it's been great in talking to you guys and we'll work to follow up on some of these other items as soon as possible. Thanks, Earl. Thank you. All right. Other things that are are working or are not working with board structure here. I do want like to therapy time. Yeah, I do want to come up <laughs> with a couple of things that are I think just on me and Jake and Michelle to work out small procedural things. Um, well, I guess large impact but small procedural items. Um, Historically, our agendas have not been going out to the public early enough, really. I mean, we've been sending them pretty late, but that's because we have been forming them. We, the board, have been forming them very late. Um, Jake and I, just for awareness for the group, are going to set up a standing meeting um, each month with just the two of us to make sure we're planning not just the next month, but like looking further out so that we can get those agendas solidified, not just for this group, but also for the viewing public early enough that like that notice is out there. Um, and honestly, to, to make sure for the benefit of the folks that come to speak to us that they can be better prepared and not being surprised with presentations, you know, a, a, a couple of weeks before we meet. Um, so yeah, I don't think any any direct action to take there that we're not already doing, but just wanted to make the rest of the board aware of that. Hey, Jonathan and Jake, this is Michelle. If you guys want to include me in on that, I could just be a fly on the wall when you guys are discussing that. So at least I'm I'm prepared to be able to react to it. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that, that might be helpful because we could immediately say like, is like, do you know who we would talk to about this? Or or any like, you know, what's what's within reason here? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you're not an insignificant part of the reason why we were looking at creating a better structure here, Michelle. So yes, happy to include I you. I appreciate that greatly. <laughs> uh, Joe. Yeah, I'd just like to thank, uh, I think we have strong leadership right now. And so I think we've, we've gotten a good place. 
And I'm, I'm glad you guys are uh, bringing these questions up and, and really getting us to think about it so we can move forward. So I thank you for your effort. Thank you very much. And to, to Jake's recent point, I'd like to be sure we include Michelle in that. She's really tying this board together and I appreciate it very much. Yeah. I totally rely on Michelle whenever I have any questions. She can tell you that. And for some reason, she doesn't seem to have anything to do and answers me immediately. So thank you, Michelle. If we have the time here before we move to our, like our final agenda topic, I think I, I would love a little bit clear. Oh, actually, back up to say, Jake and I haven't discussed exactly what we want to do with all this feedback, but I think a pretty obvious takeaway is we're going to be, you know, taking all this together and trying to brainstorm some recommended changes or solutions to the board. Technically, per our bylaws, we are benevolent dictators. We can just decide what to do. But, you know, I'd like to get everyone else's opinion on which way we go. Um, the so with that, like with the, with the conclusion, like where we want to go, there are a couple areas where I think I'm not clear on some of the desire. Um, Tanger, in particular, I know you were walking right now, so I'll try not to put you on the spot. But you mentioned that you were very interested in the concept of figuring out what we do about community response and that also on the variety of boards you have been on any committee that focuses on just community engagement broadly becomes a little listless after a while it doesn't really know where to direct um, until certain things like this come up i'm wondering in your mind and in others minds um would this be a good example of a situation where we don't need a standing community engagement committee because there might not be something to be working on all the time but when things come up like this, like we want to figure out how we get an adequate response process and me mechanism with the public, a few people raise their hands and say, all right, the three of us are going to take that on for the next month or two months or, or whatever it is, three months it is, um, and then break. Like we don't need, but I guess walking away from this, I'm not really sure people are saying, I think I really like the standing committees. I just want to be on a different one, or I don't want them to be required, or I want them to be pre-scheduled, or if people are more interested in this idea of, let's reduce the number of standing committees let's make say like attended or joining as many or as few as you want to optional and um let's also make joining them at all optional like you can also just be a committed member of the board who's like look i don't currently work on any committees at this moment i guess i'm i'm trying to get a sense from from not just tanger but the group of like how much do we like the standing committees how much do we want to focus on adjusting that um what, what, what would get people like excited to be involved instead of feeling like that they are they have the burden of being involved i guess i per, to be completely honest having another meeting with the subcommittee in the month feels like too much which is partly why i haven't done it um i like the idea and i'm I am of, of like if it's project by project figuring out like who is the contact who do you refer people to I like that idea I like the idea of figuring out how yeah how we get people responses to their questions. Um, so uh, you know would be would be happy to do that that doesn't require a meeting every single month. Um, I don't know about community engagement around projects like you know there's some learning to do here about what Dottie's um, what their standards are around how they engage with community around certain projects I don't I don't know if our if you know we're in a place I guess we can make recommendations that's you know that's our role is to if we hear about a community process that didn't go so well or something but that's that's getting into sort of another task and i i'm not sure where i sit with that no that totally makes sense i mean you just hearing that you're like hey i think another demanded meeting every month is too much and to julie's point that wasn't sold to us as part of the board that i have to do this i mean that's really good feedback for a new structure for us yeah i really love the idea of having the list of you know dotty representatives for the district and who you reach out to for maintenance and all that i know that it changes but like at the least we need that so that we can tell people point people in the right direction i don't know how keen dotty is on sharing those lists of people's contacts and names but i have i think everybody should have all the information um yeah and 
yeah, happy to research. Like, um, anyway, I'll stop there. I, I think that is like like Jonathan said. I think that's good feedback, and I think that's kind of where where we figured there there may be some issues is that you know some things just aren't working for people, um, and which is why it's a good good time to like look into them and figure out how to make it work. Um, and I think that you know I ideally we're putting people in places where they're excited about the work, right? And we're giving these kind of committees the ability to kind of dive deeper in a way that we cannot in this meeting to work on things. But that doesn't mean that the structure necessarily is best as a single meeting every month for everyone. Like obviously uh, this summer you did your own community engagement with your with your Colorado Sun piece. So like we know there's ways that you want to engage in the community, right? That could be very different. And I think that maybe that's just our path is figuring out what does that look like? And, and maybe for community engagement, it really is out of place as a standing meeting um, and, and we got to figure out how to, how to find that path. Uh, but yeah, definitely tinker on it and, um, and, and figure that out. But I, I think we want to, how do we concentrate this energy and put it in the right spots and make this, this, this meeting and this, this board be something we can all be really proud of. Um, I think is the goal, but Aileen. Yeah. So I think I want to add a few things that I heard you guys talk about. Um, so I think Tangier made a comment about, you know, uh, what's going to get me really jazzed up to go to another meeting each month. And then Jake, you made a comment then about concentrating our energy on certain, in certain areas. And I think maybe it's because I, I, I certainly can own this, that maybe I haven't been able to pay enough attention to the current committee structure. That being said, I, it feels a little, feels like we're really spread thin and I'm, I'm a little, um, I've seen us take on some tough issues in a few of these meetings where we concentrated our energy together in spaces where I think we're really passionate about as a group. And I feel like even in those short brief moments, we've made minor amounts of headway that I think will, will make a big deal. And I got, I'm a little worried Maybe I need a little bit more education and reminding, but at the same time, I would just like to ask the question of like, are our committees spread too thin? I mean, Paul and I are the only people on our committee and are the other committee, do other committees have two or three people on them? Also, would, would we be more served, would Paul and I be more served or the committee or this community be more served if Paul and I then put our energy into another committee that it's really clear what, how to push the needle. The last thing I'll say that I remember is having a very early conversation about was being very intentional about our committees and matching them to the areas that this, this committee, or sorry, this count advisory board can make an impact on. And so maybe, sorry, we're making dinner at my house. Um, where, I think I'm still a little unclear where these where these specific areas are going to make big impacts on. Maybe I just need to be schooled, but those are my observations. I would just add as we contemplate this issue. And I that being said, I still think we're doing really good work, and it's we're just really perfecting something that's still quite new. Thank you, Aileen. Um, any other thoughts on our ops review, uh, before Jonathan mentioned us benevolent dictators, take it back. At least he said benevolent, which I'm glad about. Uh, Chris has got his hand up. Chris has got his hand up, yeah. Oh, sorry, Chris. I didn't see that one. Oh, no, no worries. Uh, I just want to echo what everybody, what I think everybody is saying and the fact that, you know, I'll, I'll give you an example for, you know, Alan is doing a great job of leading the finance committee. However, there's only two or three people in it. And sometimes we can't, a couple of us, if two of us can't make it, we can't have a discussion. So if the group can be bigger so we can hold a quorum, that helps at least advance the discussion. And to what I think, I think I heard Director Levy say, and what I heard Director McCollum say is like, you know, hey, if we can just get those groups bigger and have these ad hoc ones that you all are talking about, I think that will service us really well. And that's typical of what I've seen of other boards. For example, I'm on a board that, you know, there's a, well, what is it? Uh, 
now I'm blanking out on the term, um, ethics board. The ethic board hardly ever meets unless it needs to meet. So, you know, for example, if Tangier and others want to get together and discuss how we're going to communicate with the community on a specific topic, create a policy for that, great. You meet, the, meet on that, get that going. You don't have to meet until something else comes up. So just, again, I think I'm echoing what everybody else is saying. I apologize for repeating that to everybody, but um, I've seen that work in other areas. So again, it's not uncommon. Great, thank you, Chris. I appreciate that. Alan? Yeah, I just wanna echo um, the finance committee when we were given direction and we needed to do that letter, we jumped on it, we met as a group, we came out with the recommendations, Chris and Kurt were great on that. Um, so I think if you give something that people are passionate about or direction, I think it's always good. I, I'm leaning towards the, hey, maybe we consolidate committees or consolidate meetings a little bit, and give proper expectations about, you know, what each group needs to do. So that's just my two cents. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right. Any other comments on the ops review and or at this point, I'm just going to open it up to other odds and ends as well. I think I could share briefly. Um, no odds and ends pertaining to this meeting, but in our next meeting, like agenda is not fully finalized, but we are planning to have a few folks from the department come to present about the I-25 and Broadway interchange that a couple of public commenters um, spoke about a couple of months ago. Um, ideally, this has not been scheduled yet, but a, a couple of our projects committee members will meet with them in, in advance to share what we've heard and researched and learned and like do or do not understand at this juncture in hopes of co-crafting that presentation to some extent and making sure it's an effective one for this group. Um, don't have a complete agenda and timing yet, but just uh, giving everyone a heads up that that's what we intend to talk about next month. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, all right. Any other odds and ends? You guys are making me nervous. It's my first co-chaired meeting and we're going to end early and I don't know if that's a success or a failure. So <laughs> success. I keep on talking. You got two minutes. <laughs> exactly. OK. Don't encourage him, Joe. Free. Early Good meetings chair. are better, but. Can we motion uh, that? Can I put forward a motion since we seem to be done and not belabor anymore and motion to adjourn? Oh, yeah. I can do it. That's a second from Jonathan. <laughs> Everyone in favor? Aye. 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 Necessary. Bye bye. Thank you so much, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone.